Good right. morning, Senator how are you? Hey, how are you? It's good to be with you all. It's good to spring see you. Springtime. It's springtime out there. Uh, well, for a moment, apparently. For a couple of days, maybe. <laughs> I wouldn't exactly. go that far. I think it's going to not feel like that by the end of the afternoon. Oh, uh, really? It's good. Not even two days, huh? Nope. Oh, my. It's good to have you in the studio, though, because I know that we uh, we offer this to Claire McCaskill when she's here to come by the studio, and, we, and I'm, I'm glad that you, you're able to make it in. Uh, we're going to get to what brings you to town here today. Though. So is the Claire McCaskill offer here just to prove you're totally bipartisan? We're totally bipartisan. Any, any United I'm States not, senator can is. come by. Any United States <laughs> no, senator can come by. Uh, let me tell you, I am not bipartisan. <laughs> the program is bipartisan. There you go. You got see. It. You That's see. why we're here. We're counterweights. Um, is Renee scheduling the rest of your day for you today? <laughs> I just uh, wondered that. Uh, she's got you carefully timed out. She, you know? she does indeed. I have All a very right. important assignment right after I've, I leave here, and uh, I'm looking forward to both both being here and being there. But the actual reason you're here today is people, are, I'm, I'm sure, are familiar, or a lot of people are familiar with the movie The Monuments Men, which uh, I think it came out on Friday or maybe the week a week ago Friday. It's George Clooney's new movie. He wrote and directed it. Um, it's got an all-star cast in it. But you're here to talk about the Monuments Men, the Monuments Men on which this movie is based. And people may be thinking, what's the link here? So explain to us, what is the link? Well, I'm, I'm sponsoring the Congressional Gold Medal for the 350 people that during World War II were part of this effort to save the treasures of Europe if they could be saved without uh, the cost of a single allied life. It was a... It was a activity really driven by our government more than any other government. It was initially thought that what these people would be doing would be trying to be sure that we didn't needlessly destroy buildings, which is why it's called, they were called the Monuments Men, uh, but not having any real idea the the thuggery and the thievery of the Nazis. Uh, they didn't have any idea that most of their time would actually be spent recovering artwork. And by 1951, more than 5 million pieces of art and sculpture had been returned to the people they'd been stolen from. And of course, uh, you know, we're, they're still finding yeah, artwork right. in Germany, particularly today. Now, some people might think, well, in the grand scheme of something as traumatic and as long lasting as the effects of World War II, y you know, how would this play? How was this important? But actually, it was hugely important. And the, the Allies, I think, realized what was going on with these artifacts. And I know that for a lot of aircraft bombers, um, the pilots were given, or, or the, at least the navigators, were given maps of targets, but they also picked out certain, as you talked about, monuments, buildings that they wanted them to avoid if at all possible. And that was the sort of try and preserve buildings part of this. Right, and and uh, bombing in World War II was not all that precise but either. No, so, you know, right. even, no. even at my your best... That. Even at your best. And your mother was, was your mother in London in World War II? My or? mom was in South Yorkshire, and uh -huh. the Nazis, when they started the Blitz, they also went after, they'd say, Steel, steel City. And so uh -huh. they went after the steelworks. Right, right. And what, as you said, it was not precise. And a couple of German bombers, the story goes, they missed the target, but they had to shed weight on their way back to Germany. And the way they shed weight was they just dropped the bombs indiscriminately. And one of them landed in the bottom of the garden. Uh, in Wakefield, the town called Wakefield, where my mum was, and she was covered in plaster and all really? kinds of... They had to dig really? her out. She was fine. Right. That's kind of how my mum is. Uh, <laughs> she just recovers, uh, right? She's, uh, yeah. She just recovers. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but, yeah. Yeah, so it, but very imprecise. Yeah. Very imprecise, and at one point, I know that the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa was almost hit by a bomb just because the bomb fell in the wrong yeah. place. But uh, General Eisenhower gave an interesting order, which was we're going to save the treasures of, of of our civilization when we can, but not at the cost of one right. allied life. Right. If, there's, if the choice is the building or one allied life, the building goes. Mm -hmm. But if we can save the buildings without uh, danger to uh, the people fighting for our cause and for freedom, we're going to do that as well. And there were about 350 of these people, Simon and Renee, and 14 of them were Missourians in one right. way or another. Ten of them born here. Uh, another ten, uh, four of them born here, another ten of them worked here. A couple worked at the University of Missouri over the years. Yeah. And interestingly, like almost everybody else in World War II, this is just a story that's largely not told because they didn't talk about it. I was over at the State Historical Society where I'm a board member this morning, and there was a 1980 uh, oral interview with uh, one of the men who was here uh, and... Uh, he mentioned briefly that he was in Berlin for quite a while after the war trying to 
uh, work in Berlin, but he doesn't mention what he's doing at all, even though he's a pretty intricate figure uh, in what was done to restore the, this artwork and these sculptures to people. The, 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 the Last Supper, Michelangelo's The Last Supper, the Ghent altarpiece, uh, a, uh, some uh, wonderful uh, artwork uh, was just looted and was taken to Hitler and Goring and others took that. And uh, um, this is a, a great story to be told. And the lesson to learn here is not just the World War II lesson, but as we look at things in the future, uh, wh what kinds of things do we need to be sure we preserve and draw attention to to always ensure that as much as we can, we benefit from who we have been, and that allows us to be who we hope to be. One of the movie clips that I found to be interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, and it, it makes me want to go see this movie, is one of the Monuments men is trying to tell uh, one of the Allied commanders, okay, you can't hit this, and you can't hit that, and the Allied guy is just, well, exactly what is it that I'm after again? Yeah, his, uh -huh, he was exactly. expressing his frustration right. about what... I'm supposed to be fighting a war here, and you're telling me what I cannot hit. And it was just, it's just, and they do it much better than I just did here on the air, but the, the sort of a, the seriousness and the humor that they tied together and the frustration of trying to preserve it in an area that when you see the way they shot it, everything's falling apart except this one building still standing and trying to make sure, please don't hit this building. And it, it brings to mind how did all of that survive? And so clearly there was an effort to make sure that things survived that war because Europe was destroyed. I mean, so much was destroyed. Right, Even some right. things that we wish hadn't been destroyed right. were harmed. And this is a story that, uh, you know, generally you've got to believe that it's not the top line thing that commanders in the field are thinking about, maybe even knowledgeable of. And so uh, some guy who's a, 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 in, in a military uniform, but clearly an art historian from somewhere shows up and says, you can't go near this building by order of General Eisenhower. And Oh, yeah, right. Now, who are you again, Corporal? Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me exactly why we need to do that. But it's uh, – and two of the Monuments men were killed in, yeah. uh, by, uh, by enemy troops. Um, they um, were generally art historians, museum managers, mostly American, but uh, European as well. And a total of 350 of them, four, four, uh, four or five of them are still alive today. Uh, but uh, it's a story worth telling, and there's a lot to be uh, learned from it. You mentioned a lot of this they did do, though, despite the fact that, they, that you know their mission was different to the overall war effort. They really were taking their life in their hands on a daily basis with some of the things that they had to do to try and rescue some of this hour. And to some extent, almost by definition, they're in front of the troops instead of behind the troops. That's right. If you're, if you're yeah. out there saying, you know, literally posting signs on buildings, historic structure, uh, try to stay yeah. away from this structure at all costs, arguing with commanders, and then later uh, trying to find things that somebody else doesn't want you to find, trying to find things that somebody else has already stolen and you're trying to recover uh, during the war and even to some extent, maybe even after the war, but certainly until the war itself is over. Uh, and so it's uh, there's one character in this uh, movie uh, played by a Missourian, John Goodman yeah. from St. Louis, who plays a sculptor uh, who I, I don't think they're really, they use the regular, the names in the movie itself, but a guy named Walter Hancock, a St. Louis native, very involved, uh, and uh, it did later a couple of the sculptures in the United States Capitol, uh, plus the Soldiers Memorial at uh, uh, at St. Louis. He did major sculpture work there, and so there's uh, there's there's a lot of a couple of directors in the Nelson Atkins Art Museum in late in later years were monuments men uh, during World War II, and so it's a uh, it's a it's an important lesson to learn, and I think. Uh, uh, hopefully the movie and the book, and I've talked to the, the guy who wrote the book, Robert Edsel, who has taken this sort of as his cause to honor what these people did. Hopefully those two things come together to remind us of, uh, again, not just what we've done in the past, but the kind of obligations we have going uh, ongoing. Now, I'm going to put you on the spot because you may not know this. And my, my brother's in the military, and when he went into Iraq, I know they had certain requirements because he was a targeting captain at that time. He sat in the bottom of a of a, a track and targeted cordons about what they would hit when they would hit it with the howitzers. Yes. And so I don't know though, I never asked and never thought to ask him because there were many things. Cause he talked about, we are in an ancient civilization and some of the neat things. And I remember seeing the pictures from Saddam's palace and some of those things. What does our military do today? 
Do well, you that, know? no, it's a very good question. And I think we, we had some uh, thoughtfulness about Iraq, but probably not as much as we should have. The archaeological sites... Uh, maybe even more securing the museums. Yeah. A lot of a lot of uh, a lot was lost out of the Baghdad Museum. I was in uh, Cairo uh, not too long after Mubarak was overthrown, and the people had taken over Tahir Square. And during that process, people broke into the Cairo Museum, and a lot of something not a, a number of things are gone. Things from King Tut's tomb, other things mm. are gone, and so that's it's just one of the one of the casualties of war is that things that up until that moment people are able to collectively share, uh, someone is able to get their hands on and they become sort of lost to all but whoever owns them in an illegal way from maybe then for 100 years or something till they turn up again. Well, the Nazis, as I understand it, Congressman, just basically went through occupied France, occupied Italy, picking and choosing. There are even stories of people like Goering going through the museums and just picking out what they wanted. Absolutely. Bit bit, and that, and that's part of that's Put that's, it on a train and right. it was gone. G Goering, uh, I mean, you know, Hitler obviously had first call on anything he wanted, and uh, Goering and Goebbels and others apparently had mm -hmm. second call. And they just, at some point, you know, just to store this away for apparently the future Fuhrer Museum, yeah. uh, filled up salt mines and other things with uh, artwork that they were collectively moving back to Germany, even when the Germans were fully in control of, like, Paris. Mm -hmm. They didn't just take the things from Paris when they were leaving Paris. They took the things from Paris all the time they were controlling yeah. Paris. Um, so to bring this to what you're trying to do, you're, you're, um, is, does it take legislation to award a Congressional Medal of Honor? Because that's what you're pushing for. It, it does. Right? It does. It takes an act of Congress. It's the highest uh, honor that Congress itself can bestow. And Senator Menendez and I, from uh, he's from New Jersey, and I are co-sponsoring this legislation in the Senate. Uh, a Kay Granger from Texas is co-sponsoring the legislation in the House. And hopefully the combination of the book, the movie, uh, and other things will allow us to recognize these individuals while uh, a handful of them are still alive to personally be recognized. But I think the ongoing lesson here may be every bit as important as what, what happened in World War II, just to remind us of our, of our obligation to, uh, to try to do what we can to pass along the heritage we've been given in many ways, including uh, art and, uh, and architecture. This seems like it although you know you risk this anytime you're talking about congress itself this seems like it would be a bipartisan something that would have bipartisan agreement and you would need to move fairly rapidly because i forget what the figures are but as you said there are only five of these guys left and the figures about world war ii vets dying every day every time i hear it i think that can't be right but it is but it's a lot so i would imagine there's some haste behind this or you i would, would like hope that. so i would hope we can get this done uh, within the course of the next uh a few weeks, and that would be my goal to get it done during this Congress. Uh, and um, again, uh, like I said, these these are events that the people involved in so many ways didn't talk about. It was one of the the definitions of that generation of uh, of, of Americans who uh, came home and they just kind of wanted to move on with life. And so a lot of these great stories weren't told. Here we are, seventy years later, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and I suspect almost nobody in America knew that these people had done this or the effort they had made or the personal danger they'd actually in many cases been involved in uh, to, to get it done. We've got about five minutes left. Let me switch gears on you. Um, uh, is anything going to get done on immigration this time around or is that dead in the water? You know, I, I think it's probably not going to happen. I've always thought the best way to deal with the immigration issue was to break it up in about three different pieces because I think you'd get three, you get a, a collectively better product if you looked at okay, what, how do we secure the border, and not only the border itself, but the hiring desk border as well. What are the legitimate workforce needs of the country, both in the skilled and unskilled area, and what do you do with people who came illegally or stayed illegally? And that's about half and half. I think you have a better product if you divide those up, but there's not enough trust right now in Washington to get that done. I think the the House said they're willing to move at least part of that now. The, but then the president says over and over again over the last uh, two months, whatever the Congress won't do, I'm prepared to do with my, with my pen and my telephone. And if uh, it's hard to negotiate with somebody who tells you what he doesn't get the negotiated way, 
he might just take by executive order. And I think that's really backed the Republican House of Representatives away but, from doing this. But the Republicans, let's face it, I mean, uh, what was it? The night of his inauguration had a high-level meeting with all the Republican movers and shakers saying, we're going to we're gonna block this guy at every step. So, oh, I, don't. I mean, I, I, I think, now, you know, now, for some, you to now, say that the president, I mean, I can kind of understand his frustration. Uh, now, can, you know, so. I, we just, I just helped my daughter study for a constitution test. And part of the, the beauty of our government is supposed to be a balance of power where there's a check and a balance between the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. And it occurs to me as I was helping her study that all these executive orders completely bypass that balance but, of power and shift it completely that, to the White House. And that's not how it's supposed to work. That's true, but were Republicans no, screaming like this when how President, it's to President work. Bush had a, a whole slew of executive orders? So, Name one that was as big as immigration. There were plenty all the time in signing statements. I think he set the record. So, and he's not said he will do it on immigration either, but I think he's, he's using the influence of the White House. That's what you do, isn't it, Senator, when you're well, president? Well, I think, but I, I think, Simon, I think whenever the country, for whatever reason, decides they want to divide the government between two political ideas and two political parties, the constitutional... Uh, result of that is that things don't happen as quickly as if you don't divide the government. Uh, you know, the last two years President Bush was president. He didn't get nearly as much done as he did the first six because he had a Democrat Congress. Uh, and there weren't executive orders that offset that. I, I do think the Constitution matters. Uh, I'd like to see the government uh, get to greater conclusions. I'm very frustrated by this idea that if you don't get exactly what you want, you just as soon not have anything uh, in society, at home, in a community, in a democracy. That's a great formula not to get anything. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of blame to go around. And certainly the president shares part of that blame. He, he is in the best position to figure out what he'd like to do that's possible. And it's that last part of that equation that as bright a man as he is, he has had a hard time figuring out how he can add that to what he could do as president. What would he like to do that's possible rather than what would he like to do that's, in his mind, perfect? Well, certainly I know you've been prepared to come to the table, unlike some of your colleagues uh, who you maybe don't want to talk about here on the air uh, on that side, who are probably <laughs> driving you as crazy as they drive us on the left side of the aisle. They shall remain nameless, but they come from the Texas area. Um, <laughs> well, the Constitution so, does matter. It matters in the eighth well, grade, and it matters uh, to the country. I, and and we need to we, we do need to be sure that we understand the the true miracle of how our system's supposed to work. And it's not supposed to be efficient, and it's not very efficient. <laughs> well, that's, which is why which well, is that's, why that's right at the moment. For sure. Which is why so, Europeans well, have such a hard time. And I don't mean anybody <laughs> anybody from a parliamentary system which is designed to be ultimately efficient has yeah. a hard time understanding how our process works at all because well, it's designed to be really hard to get anything done and we may have overdone that part of the I, design a little bit in the last couple of years. I think so. I think, I think that's, right. that's probably true as, as far as a parliamentary system goes, which has its advantages and drawbacks as well, obviously, as you just pointed out. So I know you have to go and talk more about this kind of thing here in a couple of minutes, so we, we have to let you go in a couple of minutes, but is this the kind of thing you're taking up with Renee's kids today? I, wh what are you talking about today to... to Renee's kids. I make it sound like you're the teacher, but the kids at the, I am going uh, to go to uh, to Casey School. Yeah, yes. Renee, is that where I'm headed? Yes. And they've been doing the Constitution. And I was trying to think as I was walking. Now, what are the what are the two words that you would maybe the, be the best two words to understand the uniqueness of the Constitution? And I think one would be compromise, and two would be balance of power. An okay. idea that nobody had ever really thought of before the American Constitution that you'd you'd, you'd frame a government that was designed to be so so balanced that it would control itself and it was a it was a unique concept that others have copied mm -hmm. but nobody thought of it before those people in Philadelphia and uh, and of course the compromises of the constitution itself you went from a uh, a government that was going to be hard to get something done but clearly a government that was a lot stronger than the government they were replacing one of the un undiscussed uh, parts of the Constitution for those who love and honor the Constitution today is that the people who wrote the Constitution didn't like government. The truth is the people who wrote the Constitution were designing a stronger government 
than they had under the Articles of Confederation, but they still wanted that government to be restrained and controlled and defined. But they weren't developing a weaker government than they had. They were developing a stronger government than they'd had for the decade after the revolution. And I think they, was, they were trying to design a government that worked for the people, which is ultimately who they were thinking of, right? It's the, first document, that, so. it's the first document that ever started that way. We the people. We the right. people. It is the secret to the whole deal. And, you know, the Magna Carta started, we the barons of England. Lots uh, of documents yeah, yes. have started differently. Oh. But this is the first one that ever suggested that the people themselves were the, the root and the power and the originator of the government they would have, and it is the miracle of who we are, and we need to not lose uh, touch with that. Um, I know we've got to let you go because you've got to get to school. So uh, thanks for coming by. It's always good, and uh, always enjoy having you on the program. Certainly, whenever you can make it to the studio, the, the door is open, so to speak. Great to see you.